The third and final, they promised, season of Star Trek Picard is about to begin. It's no secret I didn't exactly enjoy the previous season of the show. You may have even heard that I called season two of Picard by far the worst season of any Star Trek show and one of the worst seasons of television I've ever seen because I said those things and those are my opinions, but maybe season three will surprise me. I don't expect it, but I'm open to the possibility and I hope this last season of Picard is good. Anyway, while we're waiting, I thought it would be fun to take a look back at some of Jean-Luc Picard's past adventures, but I didn't want to just do a video talking about a bunch of random episodes from TNG. You know me. I gotta have an angle. There's gotta be a point, a thesis, a question to be answered that gives the proceedings some focus. Like how pro wrestlers always used to concentrate their attack on a specific body part of their opponent instead of just doing every move they know in no particular order. Not how I roll, kids. I need my Trek Actually videos to have good psychology, not be meaningless spot fests. That's why we're going to try to answer a question in this video. And hopefully, as we search for the answer to that question, it will lead us to a few insights into the character of Jean-Luc Picard and some of the others with whom he has shared his adventures over the years. And won't that be nice? The question in question, who is actually Captain Picard's greatest nemesis? For as much as Jean-Luc Picard has the reputation of being the most diplomatic and deliberative of the Star Trek captains, the dude sure has made more than his share of mortal enemies over the years. The fact that he's not the shoot-first-ask-questions-later type hasn't stopped a whole bunch of people from wanting to kill him, or at least make life really, really difficult for him. I'm telling you up front, that this is not going to be a comprehensive list of every single antagonist we've ever seen Picard face. I'm limiting the scope of the video to the ones that I consider particularly memorable or significant to Picard himself. Among the earliest of those is a guy who shows up initially in season one of Star Trek The Next Generation in the episode The Battle. I'm referring to Damon Bach. Airing less than halfway through TNG's first season, the battle sees the Enterprise meeting with a Ferengi vessel commanded by Damon Bach. Though Picard doesn't know him, Bach seems very familiar with Picard. And he's come bearing a gift. The salvaged hulk of the USS Stargazer, the ship Picard commanded before becoming captain of the Enterprise. The Stargazer was badly damaged in combat with an unidentified ship, and had to be abandoned. That was nine years ago. Bach has salvaged the Stargazer and delivered it to Picard free of charge as a token of friendship. Bach's officers, Kazago and Rata, seem more surprised by that than anyone else. They were clearly hoping to make Starfleet pay through the nose to have its ship back. Such suspicious generosity is definitely a sign Bach is up to something, but while he has to deal with that, Picard is also fighting off a series of increasingly more intense headaches. Eventually, those headaches give way to hallucinations, as Picard finds himself drawn more and more back into the past, reliving the events that led up to the abandonment of the Stargazer. Finally, Picard is back on the bridge of his old ship, alone, convinced that the battle is happening again and that the Enterprise is the unidentified ship he encountered back then. Despite appearing to be a derelict, the systems of the Stargazer have been repaired, giving it shields and weapons capability. Bach has programmed the computer to accept Picard's commands so that, as he gives orders to his phantom crew, the ship will respond accordingly. Bach, it turns out, has been manipulating Picard this entire time, causing his headaches and hallucinations using a thought maker, which is what this silver globe thingy is called, according to Bach's first officer, Kazago. That unidentified ship the Stargazer destroyed nine years ago was a Ferengi vessel, commanded by Bach's own son. Bach has crafted this whole scenario to take his revenge on Picard, to compel Picard to relive the battle, attack his new ship with his old ship, and force the Enterprise to destroy him. 
It's not a bad little plan, honestly, especially given that it comes from an era of Star Trek where the revenge plot had not yet become the predominant story structure of the franchise. Unfortunately for Bach, Riker talks to Bach's disgruntled first officer, Kazago, and figures out what's going on and manages to get through to Picard and talk him into destroying the mind control globe just in time. The Enterprise tows the Stargazer away. We never see it again. I guess they put it in a fleet museum, or melted it down for scrap, or something, I don't know. And Damon Bach is taken into custody by his own crew for pursuing an unprofitable venture. And if that was the only time we ever saw Damon Bach, I probably wouldn't have brought him up, much less began the video with him. The battle is alright, especially when you grade it on a sliding scale with the rest of Next Gen's first season, Giving Bach a personal vendetta rooted in Picard's past provides him with a tiny bit of depth, but he mostly comes across as a villain of the week. No big deal. However, the battle is not the only time we ever see Damon Bach. He returns six years later to attempt to carry out another very complicated act of revenge in the seventh season episode, Bloodlines. The Enterprise encounters a space probe that contains a holographic DM to Picard from Bach, who appears on the bridge like, Hey, I found out about your secret son, asshole, and now I'm going to avenge the death of my son by killing yours. Skull emoji, middle finger emoji. Bach's hologram also mentions the name of Picard's alleged son, Jason Vigo. Though Picard doesn't know him, the name clearly rings a bell, and he orders Data to search Federation records for any information, beginning with the name of Jason's mother, Miranda Vigo. A bit later, Riker tells Picard that Miranda Vigo does indeed have a son named Jason, who is 23 years old. Their last known location is the planet k 5. Picard says to Riker, Okay, look, I appreciate you being cool about it, but you're my first officer, so you deserve to know what the deal is with me and Miranda Vigo. Riker's like, Yes! Oh my god, I've been biting my tongue since Hollowbox said that shit about you having a son. Tell me, tell me, tell me! And you don't have to leave anything out. You can give me all the filthy details because I promise I won't tell anyone, not even Worf. Maybe Worf, but no one else, I swear. Picard says, Miranda Vigo and I had a fling about 24 years ago while I was taking shore leave on Earth. It was very intense, and intense because you didn't use protection? I mean, obviously. Not what I meant, but yeah. Anyway, she never mentioned being pregnant, and we lost touch not long after I returned to duty, but there is a chance Jason Vigo is my son. Hot! Can we just go to Kmore 5 so Bach doesn't kill this kid? The Enterprise arrives at Kmore 5. They locate Jason Vigo and beam him aboard while he's in the middle of a rock climb. Picard tries to explain the situation while tiptoeing around the fact that he hit and quit Jason's mom and might be Jason's absentee father. But Jason's like, look, my mom's dead anyway, and she never told me who my father was, so we might as well just get on with it. They go to sickbay, where Dr. Crusher administers a paternity test. And look... I know some of you are probably expecting me to make a Maury joke here. I get it. I do love the low-hanging fruit. I even prepared a prop to go along with it. And yeah, I could do a little skit and open this envelope, take out the paper, act like I don't know what's on it, and reveal the test results as though it's some kind of a surprise. But I don't need to do that. Why fall back on cheap theatrics when I can rely on my pure expertly crafted and delivered verbal wit. Anyway, it looks like Jason is Jean-Luc's bastard after all. Crusher's test confirms it. Picard takes Jason back to his quarters for a little father-son chat, assures Jason that he would have been a part of his life if he'd, you know, been aware of his existence before now, and promises to return him to Kmore 5 as soon as this whole vengeful Ferengi trying to kill you in retaliation for the death of his son thing has been resolved. Picard finally gets a Ferengi official on the phone to ask why Damon Bach is no longer in prison, and the official says, oh, well, he's not a Damon anymore, but he did buy himself out of prison like two years ago. That night, Bach appears in Picard's quarters like, I'm gonna get him! The next day, the Enterprise runs into another probe. The probe explodes, delivering a message in a Ferengi code of alternating flashes that translates to, My revenge is at hand, baby emoji, tombstone emoji. 
Retreating to his ready room in frustration, Picard finds Bach sitting in his chair. Bach says, hey, so how do you like your son? Is he cool? Are you going to be sad when I murder him all the way to death? Picard's like, look, I'm sorry about blowing up your son, but his ship attacked my ship. It was self-defense. Killing my son isn't going to bring your son back. And Bach says, no, but it is going to make us even. And as a Ferengi, I appreciate a balanced ledger. He doesn't actually say that. But for a cheesy one-liner from a Ferengi villain, I think it's pretty good. Bach beams away, but later Jordy and Data scam Picard's chair where Bach was sitting and find evidence that he's been using a subspace transporter. Such a device has a potential range of several light years, but now that they know what to look for, if Bach uses it again, they might be able to trace it back to the source and find where Bach has been operating from. Meanwhile, Jason has a seizure, and after an examination, Dr. Crusher diagnoses him with a degenerative neurological disorder. The only thing is, this particular disorder is usually hereditary. But Jason's mother didn't have it, and Picard doesn't have it, so what gives? Crusher decides to run a microcellular scan to see if she can track down a cause. Picard and Jason have a heart-to-heart -heart on the holodeck. Jason has resisted Picard's attempts to get close to him, but now they finally have a breakthrough. They talk about Jason's mom. Picard tells Jason, look, I know life on Kmore 5 is rough, and I know you're a criminal and a thief and a scumbag, but guess what else? You're my son, and that's never going to change. Picard and Crusher have a quick conversation, something about that microcellular scan she did on Jason, probably nothing important, and then Bach activates his subspace transporter again and beams Jason away. There's not enough time to trace that transporter beam, but fortunately Bach beams in another probe with a message for Picard, taunting him that he's about to kill Jason. Data is able to trace the transporter beam from that probe and get a fix on Bach's ship. It's too far away for the Enterprise to get there in time to save Jason, even at maximum warp, so Picard has Geordi modify the transporter so that he can beam through subspace straight to Bach's ship. Beaming in with his phaser drawn, Picard's like, everybody reach for the sky or I'll blow Bach's block off. With his phaser. By shooting it at him. Bach says, no way, Picard. Drop it or your son dies. But Picard says, cut this shit, Bach. I know what's really going on here. Jason Vigo developed a neurological disorder he has no reason to have. And when Dr. Crusher ran a microcellular scan on him, she discovered that the disorder was caused by his DNA being resequenced. It all adds up to one thing, Bach. Miranda Vigo is his mother. But I, am not the father. Bach's crew, who were under the impression they were helping to kidnap Jason for a ransom, turn on him and take him into custody. That just keeps happening to him, doesn't it? The Enterprise arrives to pick up Picard and Jason, and then they drop Jason back off at Kmore 5. Jason tells Picard that Dr. Crusher thinks the damage from the genetic resequencing can be completely reversed, so he won't have to worry about the degenerative neurological disorder. Picard gives Jason a gift, an archaeological relic Jason had noticed in Picard's quarters earlier, and they bid a fond farewell. Jason returning to the only life he's ever known, Picard presumably going back to his quarters to have a drink and bask in the rare and exquisite form of bliss that can only come from thinking you're a parent and then finding out later that you're not. C-H-I-L-D-L-E-S-S -S spells relief. Now, is Damon Bach the greatest nemesis Captain Picard ever faced? No. But come on, give the dude some credit. He went and found the Stargazer somewhere years after it had been abandoned, got its weapons and engines and shields working again, got his hands on one of those thought maker globes, which are apparently not easy to come by, and tried to trick Picard into attacking and getting blown up by his own ship. And when that didn't work, he came back six years later 
tracked down an ex-girlfriend of Picard's who had a son who didn't know who his father was, a not inconsiderable feat all by itself, resequenced Jason's DNA without him noticing, convinced Picard that Jason was his son, abducted him, and almost succeeded in killing him just to get Picard back for killing Bok's son in a fight Bok's son started. I'm not saying all of that makes Bok Khan Noonien sing, but respect the hustle. Also making Bach worthy of a mention is the fact that he was one of only a handful of antagonists to Picard who made multiple appearances in TNG. Another recurring villain, one who also has a personal connection to Picard, albeit a more convoluted one, is this familiar face right here, Commander Sela of the Romulan Empire. Sela first appears in the fourth season episode, The Mind's Eye, as one of the Romulans involved in the abduction and brainwashing of Geordi LaForge. We don't see Sela's face, though. She remains hidden in the shadows. She steps out of those shadows in her second appearance, the final scene of season four's year-end cliffhanger, Redemption, revealing herself to be a dead ringer for the resoundingly dead Tasha Yar just before the episode fades to black, leaving millions of Trekkies to spend the summer asking themselves, what was the deal with that? The deal with that, we learn in Redemption 2, is that Sela is the daughter of Tasha Yar. That is, Tasha Yar from the alternate timeline that briefly existed in the episode Yesterday's Enterprise. That Tasha returned to the past with the crew of the Enterprise C where, Sela explains to a dubious Picard, she survived that ship's fateful battle with the Romulans and was taken prisoner. A Romulan officer took a liking to her. She became his consort in exchange for his sparing the lives of her fellow prisoners, and the result of their union was Sela. Picard's like, so wait, if the Tasha who was your mother came from an alternate timeline that only existed because the Enterprise-C came into the future and ceased to exist once the Enterprise-C returned to the past, wouldn't that version of Tasha cease to exist as well once the timeline reset? And Sela says, yeah, I never thought of that. Really good question. I guess my response would be to say that you should stop overthinking it and shut the hell up. Sela is opposed to Picard, but unlike with Bach, it's nothing personal. She just has certain goals, which Picard prevents her from achieving. She tries to start a couple of wars, but in sneaky ways, like by turning Geordi into a sleeper agent and trying to have him assassinate the governor of a Klingon colony who was struggling to put down a rebellion, by secretly supporting the Duras sisters, Lursa and Bator, in their efforts to take control of the Klingon Empire in the Redemption two-parter, and later by trying to sneak a Romulan invasion fleet into Vulcan space aboard stolen Vulcan ships in the Unification two-parter from Season 5 that guest stars Leonard Nimoy as Spock. All of those plots were foiled by Captain Picard and his crew, so really, Sela would have been better off just openly bombing someplace instead. It just goes to show, if you want to start a war, just do it. Don't get cute with it. Let that be a lesson to you. From Star Trek. Speaking of Lursa and Bator, they're recurring nemeses as well, aren't they? After the Redemption two-parter, they appear once more in TNG in Season 7's Firstborn, but that's a Worf episode, and their participation in it doesn't have anything directly to do with Picard. Picard's only in one scene, in fact. Lursa and Bator also appear in the film Star Trek Generations, and I guess you could say that they function as more direct enemies of Picard in that one, since they're acting as stooges for Dr. Soren, and Soren is definitely an antagonist to Picard there. Hey, wait a second. In the mind's eye, Sela is one of the masterminds behind the abduction of Geordi, where he's brainwashed and manipulated through a modification to his visor to become an unwitting pawn of the villains. And in Generations, Soren abducts Geordi, turns his visor into a spy camera, and sends Geordi back to the Enterprise so he can transmit video back to Soren's ship and become an unwitting pawn of the villains. In Redemption, Sela teams up with Lursa and Bator, and in Generations, Soren teams up with Lursa and Bator. Did Soren just rip off Sela? Is that what he did? Is that why Nimoy declined to come back as Spock? Because in the original script, Soren was going to try to force him to give a crooked speech? And Nimoy was like, I think I did this one already. 
Not every memorable or significant nemesis Picard has faced has been a recurring character. Some, like Dr. Soren, have been one and dones. Not that I'm saying Soren is a memorable or significant Picard nemesis, he ain't. Not a super memorable Kirk nemesis either, which is a shame given, you know. But he was a one and done. So were Star Trek Insurrections Ruafo and Star Trek Nemesis's Shinzon, who, like Soren, were played by phenomenal actors, and who also, like Soren, were neither memorable nor significant, which is why this is the only bit in the video where I'm even going to mention them. Not every memorable or significant nemesis Picard has faced has been a physical challenge to him either. In fact, some of his most definitive conflicts have been mainly psychological in nature. One such conflict is depicted in the fourth season TNG episode, The Drumhead, which I summarized in my own inimitable fashion way back in 2018 for my video, Why Jean-Luc Picard is Actually the Hero We Need Right Now, where Picard must stand against the witch hunt being carried out by retired Admiral Satie. Another more grueling example can be seen in Season 6's Chain of Command two-parter, the second half of which consists largely of Picard being tortured by the sadistic Gul Madred. There is a physical component to Picard's torture, of course. He's stripped naked, hung from the ceiling by his wrists, and left there overnight. He has a device implanted in his body that triggers a debilitating pain response at the push of a button. He's starved to the point that he's willing to guzzle down this totally gross thing from an egg that was still, like, alive on junk. But the part of Picard's experience as Madred's prisoner that we all remember best, and the part that still seems to haunt him at the end when he's returned to the Enterprise, is the mental and emotional torment. It starts simply enough. Madred enters the room, sits down behind the desk, turns on four bright spotlights behind his desk, and asks Picard how many there are. Four, Picard says. Nope, says Madred. There are five. You want to take another run at it? Picard's like, there are four fluorescent flares, my fascist friend. Madred picks up the pain button and says, Okay, this is for refusing to say there are five lights, and also a little extra for the alliteration, and gives Picard a jolt that puts him on the floor. Madred asks again, How many lights do you see? And Picard says, One, two, three, four lights there are, and not one more. Madred's like, Ah, rhyming. That's gonna cost you. And he zaps him again. But the torture goes beyond the how many lights do you see gimmick to become even deeper and more insidious. The next day is take your daughter to work day. And Gull Madred is there with his little girl, Jill Ora, helping her feed her pet ferret with Picard slumped over in a chair a few feet away, probably reeking of his own congealed B.O. and piss. Jill Ora says, Papa, do humans have mummies and daddies? And Madred says, yes, but they don't love their children as we Cardassians do. For example, most human parents would never even think about bringing their kids to meet the guy they were torturing. Humans are weird. <laughs> they sure are, Peanut. Now run along. Don't forget you've got firing squad practice tonight. Once Jalora is gone, Picard's like, kind of fucked up you would bring her here. Madred's like, how come? And Picard says, you're exposing her to a suffering person letting her see that you're inflicting that suffering. Madred says, yeah, well, I don't take parenting advice from people who ain't got kids, so have some more pain. Putting all jokes aside, which is tough, because if you've seen this episode, you know what a barrel of laughs it is. Madred bringing his daughter into the torture room with Picard is maybe the most sinister thing he does. The how many lights routine is a cruel piece of mindfuckery, to be sure, but think of the message it sends to Picard to see that kid there. Yes, Picard tries to use it against Madred to tell him that the sort of indifference to suffering Jill Ora learns here could someday come back to bite Madred in the ass, but having Jill Ora there also lets Picard know how truly surrounded he is. No one's going to help him. No one here thinks this is the least bit offensive or abnormal. No one's in any hurry for this to be over. The dude who runs the show is bringing his daughter to work like he's just a guy with a job in an office. He's not going anywhere. And neither is Picard. This could last forever. And that might be the most brutal torture Picard could experience, to know he might wake up in this same room day after day after day and stare into those same four lights 
with no end in sight. There is an end to Picard's ordeal. He is returned to the Enterprise thanks to the actions of Captain Jellico, the real hero of the episode, and he even gets a bit of a moral victory over Gul Madred, shouting at him one last time that there are four lights before being led away. We find out at the end that this is a bit of a bluff when Picard confides to Troy that he actually thought he saw five lights. But nobody tell Gul Madred that, okay? It'll be our little secret. So, I feel like if I don't at least talk about Q a little bit, I'll hear about it from a bunch of you in the comments. And normally I wouldn't care, but I'm already expecting an avalanche of, I can't believe you forgot about Ardra, or what about Picard's first and greatest enemy, Groppler Zorn, type of replies. So, let me do myself a favor and cut this one off at the pass. Obviously, Q is one of the great antagonists in the entire franchise, and one of the great characters, period. Season 2 of Picard notwithstanding. But is he really Picard's nemesis? He's certainly a villain as far as his role in the show, but his attitude toward Picard for most of TNG's run seems less antagonistic and more like amusement mixed with a warped kind of tough love. Like he's a scientist who loves devising fantastically difficult and dangerous mazes for lab mice but who also always hopes his favorite mouse, Little Frenchie, makes it out alive. And I think I know the point at which Q's perception of Picard shifted in this direction. It happens at the end of his third appearance, Season 2's Q Who. Q shows up to force the crew of the Enterprise to undergo a test to prove some kind of a point he's trying to make. In Encounter at Farpoint, he tried to prove that humanity had not yet evolved beyond its brutal primitive history. In Hide and Q, he tried to corrupt Commander Riker by giving him Q-like powers. And in Q-Who, he flings the ship into a distant, unexplored region of the galaxy to prove to Picard that he isn't prepared for the challenges waiting out there in the great unknown. But in Q-Who, there's a key difference. At the end of this episode, Picard doesn't prove Q wrong. Quite the contrary. To escape the threat and save the ship, Picard is forced to admit that, in this one instance, Q is right. You wanted to frighten us? We're frightened, Picard tells Q. You wanted to show us we were inadequate for the moment? I grant that. You wanted me to say, I need you? I need you. I need you, Q. I need you so bad. Q snaps his fingers and sends the Enterprise back to Federation space and relative safety. Then he turns to Picard, seeming genuinely impressed, and says, That was a difficult admission. Another man would have been humiliated to say those words. Another man would have rather died than ask for help. Another man would have been too proud to cry and beg and grovel for his life, but not you! After that point, Q's approach to Picard shifts. His next appearance is in Season 3's Deja Q, where he materializes aboard the Enterprise and announces that he's been stripped of his powers by the Q Continuum and rendered a lowly, mortal, normal human being. When asked to explain his presence on the Enterprise, Q admits, Because, Jean-Luc, in all the galaxy, you are the closest thing I have to a friend. He gets his powers back by the end of the episode, naturally, and then, when he returns the next time, in Season 4's Cupid, his aim is to help Picard. He creates a Robin Hood fantasy, in a misguided attempt to show Picard that his romantic attraction to Vosh is a weakness. His next episode after that, True Q, isn't motivated primarily by his interest in Picard, but rather his interest in Amanda, a young woman whose parents were Q, living as humans, whose own Q powers are just beginning to emerge. And his next episode after that is Tapestry where he quantum leaps Picard back into his younger self, ostensibly to allow him to change history so that he doesn't need an artificial heart, but actually to show Picard that his youthful recklessness helped to make him the person he is today. Q's final TNG appearance, which is also everybody's final TNG appearance because it's in the last episode, All Good Things, sees him jumping Picard back and forth between his past, present, and future to allow him to prevent a temporal anomaly from erasing humanity from existence. And though I hesitate to mention season two of Picard again, because 
worst season of Star Trek ever, etc. Q's aim in that season is to help Picard realize that he is worthy of love, I guess, in a convoluted way that makes no sense. Like, if Q's goal was to make Picard realize he didn't have to be alone, why did he keep interfering to help the characters who were opposed to Picard? Why do the alternate timeline changing history thing at all? Uh, oh, I said I didn't want to talk about it. Point is, after Q Who, whenever Q inserts himself into Picard's life, it's to try and do something positive for Picard, to teach him a lesson, to help him prevent the eradication of the human race. Good stuff. So, all of this is to say that Q is not Captain Picard's greatest nemesis. Cool, cool. Time well spent. Glad we had this little talk. Hey, so who is Picard's greatest nemesis if it's not Q or any of the other characters I've mentioned? Well, it's obviously these assholes here who I very deliberately did not mention specifically when talking about Q Who, their debut episode, The Borg. And I do mean the Borg as a group, not the Borg Queen. Yes, the Borg Queen is the villain in Star Trek First Contact, and yes, Picard does get to snap the Borg Queen's spine in half at the end of that movie. I'm happy for you, Jean-Luc. I hope it felt good. But for most of the movie, the Borg Queen is way more interested in data than in Picard. And Picard wouldn't have been able to snap her spine if data hadn't melted all the flesh off her bones first. It's not the Borg Queen who abducts Picard, strips him of his individuality and free will, and uses him to lead an attack against the Federation that costs thousands of lives. It's the Borg. It's not the Borg Queen who shows up in Picard's nightmares after his crew rescues him and deborgifies him. It's the Borg. And yeah, the Borg Queen is the personification of the Borg Collective, so in a sense, if I say the Borg is Picard's greatest nemesis, I'm saying the Borg Queen is his greatest nemesis by extension, but she wasn't actually involved in the abduction and assimilation of Picard or the attack on Federation space while Picard was the cutest because she hadn't been created yet. She's a retcon. The Borg are the antagonists who do the most severe harm to Picard, but it goes beyond that. If you look back at the other important nemeses we've discussed in this video, you'll see that many of them have in common a connection to Picard's past. Damon Bach wants revenge for something Picard did nine years before his first TNG appearance, an act Picard feels he had to do, but which still resulted in him killing a bunch of people. Sela is the spitting image of Tasha Yar, an officer who died under Picard's command. Even some of his lesser antagonists, like Dr. Soren or Shinzon, have this connection. Shinzon is a clone of Picard, so when Picard faces him, it's as though he's facing his own younger self. And while Soren doesn't have any sort of direct link to Picard or his past, he does leave Picard momentarily speechless when he delivers the line, they say time is the fire in which we burn, shortly after Picard learns that his brother and nephew have died in a fire. I said I wasn't going to mention Shinzon again, didn't I? God damn it. Too late to fix it now. What am I supposed to do? Go back and rewrite that earlier part of the script instead of writing this part here? Do you have any idea how much of a minute that could take? We also see, through the adventure Q sends him on in Tapestry and... God help me, the other adventure Q sends him on in season two of the Picard series, that Jean-Luc carries around a certain amount of shame, guilt, and embarrassment related to his past. And some of this is due to Picard's pride, but a lot of it comes from the fact that he knows he's made mistakes and has made some difficult choices that have hurt other people, and he has regrets about those things because he's a good person? Sure seems like Picard's past is a bit of a soft spot. So what more damaging adversary could he have than one who forces him to do things that he will spend the rest of his life regretting? The Borg are the only nemesis of Picard's that we ever see affecting him long after their direct conflict is over. Once the likes of Bach or Sela or Admiral Satie have been defeated, they're never mentioned again unless they return to challenge Picard another time. Picard does seem deeply shaken by his torment at the hands of Gull Madred at the end of the second half of Chain of Command, but by the following episode, he's fine, and Madred seems totally forgotten. 
but the Borg leave Picard so damaged that he needs an entire episode just to recover. And at the end of that episode, family, Picard's grief and guilt and frustration regarding his assimilation by the Borg finally breaks through his stoic exterior, and he tearfully tells his brother, Robert, who has not yet died in an off-screen fire, I should have been able to stop them, but I wasn't strong enough. That never happened with Damon Bach, or Go Madrid, or any of the others. The Borg, and only the Borg, pushed Picard to that point, broke Picard to that extent. And if there's a lesson in there for us, maybe it's this. Other people may inflict damage upon us that takes a long time to heal, may hurt us in ways that are unforgivable, but the cruelest, most insidious injury is the one that leaves us in a place where we are unable to forgive ourselves. Do as the heavens have done. Forget your evil. With them, forgive yourself. A wise piece of advice, that. But, as Captain Picard could tell you, It's not mine. Hey folks, hope you enjoyed this one. I'm going to let you know what the subject of the next Trek Actually video is going to be. But before I do that, I want to give shout outs to some of my newest Patreon patrons and channel members. First, the new patrons. They are Panacoke. Thanks, Panacoke. Joshua V. Devonier, thanks Joshua. Said2114, thanks Said. Elizabeth Basser, thanks Elizabeth. Alex Smith, thanks Alex. Alec, thanks Alec. Kate Jackson, thanks Kate. Space Monkey73, thanks Space Monkey73. Davahita, thanks Davahita. Mark Coots, thanks Mark. Lexander, thanks Lexander. Proxy XP, thanks Proxy. Manuel Paternoster, thanks Manuel. Next, new channel members. They are Zaza Ranger 5, thanks Zaza Ranger 5. Dr. Renard, thanks Dr. Renard. Celeste Johnson, thanks Celeste. Killock170, thanks Killock170. Michael Truin, thanks Michael. Matt Miller, thanks Matt. Ikani Tekalal, thanks Ikani. And Holly Downs, thanks Holly. If you want to support this channel, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash Steve Shives or clicking the join button to become a member of this channel. All patrons and members get access to exclusive posts that allow you to vote in the polls that determine upcoming Trek Actually topics and also submit questions ahead of time for my twice monthly Ask Away live streams. If you pledge $5 a month or more on Patreon, or become a member at the five bucks a month tier or higher, you get a shout out at the end of a Trek Actually video. If you'd rather give a one-time gift than a recurring monthly contribution, you're always more than welcome to do that by clicking the thanks button right below the video or via PayPal or Venmo. The links for those are in the video description. Many thanks. If you like what I do on YouTube, especially the Star Trek related stuff, you should also check out my side projects, The Ensign's Log, the Star Trek themed comedy podcast that I'm on alongside Jason Harding and Dana Cole, and Trek Reluctantly, the watch along stream that Dana and I do every Wednesday starting at 6 p.m. Eastern on this channel right here. As always, links in the description. Now, to next month's Regulation Trek Actually video. It's a topic that will allow us to interrogate the morals of the United Federation of Planets, to examine whether it lives up to its own lofty ideals, and perhaps even to question whether living up to such ideals is even possible. Doesn't that sound like fun? The topic is voted on by my Patreon patrons and channel members. 
Should the Federation actually have a Section 31? That's next month. I'll be back then and a bunch of times before then. So until the next time I see you, whenever that is, thanks for watching and take care, everybody.